All right, so chapter 41 is all about animal nutrition. Um, the idea of animal nutrition is accounting for taking in food, breaking it down, getting it absorbed throughout that particular animal's body systems, and then removal of any unused parts of that food item. Um, we have three different types of animals typically that we um, are going to be talking about. We have herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Um, animals can feed different ways. And we'll talk about some of those ways, um, I think, in section two. So we need to make sure an animal's diet has everything that they need to be able to survive. Um, they need to provide, it needs to provide energy, which can be converted to ATP. Um, it needs to have all the building blocks so it can build all the different macromolecules. And it needs to have different nutrients, which will help to provide enzymes or assist in some of those chemical reactions taking place. Um, they could be essential amino acids, the essential fatty acids, your vitamins, and your minerals. There are 20 different amino acids. We've talked about them earlier. Um, they can make about half of them from molecules that they have ingested. The rest, the essential amino acids, have to be obtained um, from their food directly. They cannot make those. Um, meat, eggs, and cheese will all provide those. They're considered to be complete proteins. If you do not eat those items, you only eat plant proteins, you're going to have to make sure that you take care with what you eat to get the right amounts of what you, combinations of those plants to get the essential amino acids that you need to be able to build your proteins. Um, fatty acids. Um, animals, for the most part, can synthesize fatty acids that they need. Um, they have to get them from their diet. Um, they need to have some that are unsaturated fatty acids. Um, this is not typically an area that we run into difficulties. Vitamins, organic molecules that are needed to help with the chemical reactions. We talked about those previously. I'm gonna show you a list of them. There's 13 vitamins. They can either be fat soluble, which can be stored a little bit longer in the human body, or they can be water soluble. Um, so those are ones that you're probably pretty familiar with. Minerals. Um, these are trace metals um, that you wouldn't think you'd normally ingest. You usually ingest them as part of compounds. They're very small amounts, um, and they do help to convert your food into energy. They help with dehydration. They help with function of the heart, um, skeletal, muscular, nervous systems. And if you take in too many of these, you can cause some problems with homeostasis. Okay. Malnourishment is when you are missing something. Um, this can result in deformities. It can result in disease or even death. Undernutrition is when you are not getting enough chemical energy from your diet. Um, it will cause um, you to use up stored fat or carbohydrates, break down your own proteins, um, reduce your muscle mass, can cause um, protein deficiencies for your brain, and it can cause um, long-term or uh, long-term damage or death. We can look at nutritional needs um, to get an idea if there are genetic issues at play. Um, so one example, hemochromatosis will cause iron to build up even if you're not taking in a lot of iron. Um, how we've been able to examine these is through epidemiology. It's a really cool field. You're hearing a lot about it right now. Um, and one more practical example of where this has kind of come up is um, folic acid. Um, if you are an expecting mother, um, typically they will have you take tablets with folic acid or have you eat uh, food items that contain folic acid because that will help to prevent neural tube defects. So four main stages that are going to be involved with food processing are the actual ingestion, digestion, which is where we're going to spend a good chunk of our time, absorption is another big one, and then finally elimination. So ingestion is taking in your food. Um, suspension feeders, an example of that would be like whales, where they take in water underneath um, in the ocean, and then they use their baleen to push the water back out, but to keep any of the small um, fish or other um, organisms that are present in the ocean water um, that they would then be able to ingest. So substrate feeders would be like caterpillars. They live on or in their food source. Fluid feeders would be like mosquitoes taking out our blood. And then bulk feeders, uh, the picture on the next page is truly amazing. I feel like 
Um, that is a, oh, I knew I was going to forget it. I believe it's a rock python and it is ingesting, give me one second. It's ingesting a gazelle, um, which I just think is freaking amazing. Anyway, so moving on. Digestion is breaking things down small enough that our cells are going to be able to absorb it. Um, so mechanical digestion helps to um, make the surface area of our food more manageable for the rest of the organs in our alimentary canal. Um, chemical digestion is using um, enzymes to help to split the food down into even smaller pieces so we can get it into the cells and they can make it into what they needed. Um, so this is chemical digestion, process of enzymatic hydrolysis. Um, we talked about this a little early. We'll basically split bonds and molecules by adding water. So this is going back all to that dehydration synthesis stuff. Um, where we took the water out. Now we're adding the water back in. Okay. Absorption is taking up the nutrients and elimination is getting rid of any of the undigested material. So digestive compartments, most of our animals are going to process their food in specialized compartments. This helps us to not digest um, our own cells, only digest the materials that have been taking in. Um, intracellular, um, that's when the food particles are broken down via phagocytosis. We talked about that a while back with cells. Extracellular is breaking down the food outside of the cells. This is pretty much what we do. Um, so it's in compartments that are continuous um, with the external part of the animal's body. Um, if you have a simple body plan, you tend to have a gastrovascular cavity. We see that with a hydra um, that takes care of both the digestion and the distribution. Okay. And then you can have. Um, more complex animals that will have that complete digestive tract that has both the mouth and the anus as part of their digestive tube. We also call that an alimentary canal, and it will have regions that kind of take things um, step by step um, to allow these both the digestion and the absorption processes to occur. So those are just some examples other than humans. So the mammalian digestive system has the alimentary canal. We just talked about that. And also has some accessory glands that help to get the enzymes and other juices and the pH levels that we need to be able to digest um, our food. These accessory glands include the salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. Okay. Um, food is moved along the alimentary canal by peristalsis. Um, those are the smooth muscles we talked about back in chapter 40, um, rhythmic contractions that help to kind of move things along. And then there are valves that are sphincters that basically did are like our stoplights and they determine whether something can enter and whether something can exit. Okay. So the picture on the left is, um, one that you definitely have seen before I would suspect. Um, the one on the right I thought was kind of different, but it's showing you where those accessory glands come into play and just how, um, the alimentary canal, if you just wanted to draw it, um, not necessarily how we see it in the human body, but just going from one place to another, um, going down that particular chain, you can see the different steps that would take place. Okay, so the first place where digestion takes place is in the oral cavity. That's mechanical, so that's your mouth. Um, salivary glands are able to lubricate the flu food by delivering saliva to it, and our teeth help to break it down um, using um, the salivary amylase. So that's going to break down your sugars, your carbohydrates. Um, the saliva also has mucus, um, which is going to have some other stuff in there, but the big one is the mucin. That helps to protect your mouth um, and also helps to lubricate the food. Again, we're increasing our surface area. We're turning our food into bolus. And then the tongue is able to help to make that and to help you swallow it. The pharynx is basically the connection to our respiratory system and to the rest of our digestive system. Um, it is able, the throat is able to open to both the esophagus, which is where we're going to be going next, or to the trachea, the windpipe. And we want to make sure that food doesn't go down our windpipe. So we have this um, nice little piece of our pharynx called the epiglottis, which basically will block the trachea 
um, so that food goes straight down the esophagus rather than going down the trachea. Um, if for some reason that does not work correctly, um, you might cough because you might have food inadvertently going through the windpipe, which our lungs cannot tolerate. Okay, um, so we can kind of see where everything's connecting here. And again, we've got the um, peristalsis helping to bring those boluses of food down into the stomach from our esophagus. So the boluses are able to enter the stomach when the cardiac sphincter, that's the connection between the esophagus and stomach, says, okay, it can enter, it turns green. Um, in that stomach, the food stays there. Um, as it's starting to get digested by the gastric juice, um, which is a mixture of hydrochloric acid and pepsin, an enzyme which helps to start break down proteins. So we talked about how in the oral cavity, we're starting to break down our carbohydrates. In the stomach, we're starting to break down our proteins. And then you'll also notice the gastric juice is really acidic, so that helps to break down any bacteria that might have inadvertently come in and to um, break, denature those proteins so they're more able to be broken apart. Um, we don't want that chyme to stay acidic. Um, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so how we get um, those, the gastric juices. The parietal cells are able to provide us with the hydrogen and chlorine, um, hydrogen chloride ions that come into the lumen of the stomach. Um, gastrin, which is present in the mucus, is able to help to um, encourage their um, production. Um, it stimulates their secretion. Chief cells, and I'll show you a picture with all these in them, um, will, are able to secrete the inactive form of pepsin, pepsinogen, and then in the presence of that acidic environment, it's able to become activated and then work its magic on the polypeptides. And we talked about how the mucus contains gastrin. It also kind of helps protect the stomach lining from the acidic gastric juice. And then the food, it, it, when it's ready, is now chyme. Um, it's not completely digested, but it will be leaving the stomach through the pyloric sphincter. And if for some reason you have a gastric ulcer, um, a lesion in your stomach lining, this often occurs because of that particular bacterium, Helicobacter pylori. All right, so there are your cells. You can see how you've got your parietal cells. Again, the parietal cells are the source of the hydrogen and chloride ions. The chief cells are going to give you the enzyme pepsin via pepsinogen, um, which is going to help to break down your polypeptides. And you've got lots of folds going on there. Um, to help to increase the surface area. So your stomach is constantly moving. Um, it's coordinating those contraction and relaxations to help to kind of like a washer, help to mix things up, to help to break down your food. Um, we don't want that acidic chyme to go back up into your esophagus. Um, and we want to make sure that it doesn't go into the small intestine until it has been somewhat digested. So again, those sphincters, sphincters excuse me, are acting as your stop and go um, entryways between the esophagus. Obviously, we want it not to come in, and we don't want it to go back into the esophagus, and we don't want it to go into the small intestine until we're ready for it. So the small intestine is the biggest section, um, or sorry, the longest section of our alimentary canal, um, at least in humans. And this is where the vast majority of digestion, digestion and absorption takes place. Um, the major part that we're going to talk about the small intestine is the duoden, duodenum, ugh, sorry, um, where the chyme is going to mix with all of those accessory glands. We talked about the different juices that are going to come from that, the different enzymes, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, or other chemicals. And then actually the small intestine is generating some as well. Um, that's actually where the first place we get them from. And again, I said most of the digestion is going to occur here. Um, the pancreas is able to provide all sorts of enzymes that can break down polypeptides, nucleic acids, carbohydrates and lipids. Um, and two that we're going to, that it mentions here, trypsin, chymotrypsin, um, they are released from the pancreas, but they are not activated until they are in the lumen of that duodenum. 
Um, remember that we the chyme that came in was acidic, so that needs to be neutralized. And the juices that are being released, they are able to neutralize that acidic chyme because the solution that's present there is alkaline. So it's basic acid plus base is going to make it have a neutral pH or definitely closer to neutral. Um, there's also bile that is released um, that helps to break down fats. That's the only one that will be able to do that. Um, it's actually made in the liver, but it's stored in your gallbladder. And it's also used to help break down red blood cells that aren't working anymore. And then we, so in our small intestine, we can break down all four types of macromolecules. Um, and this continues to take place. Peristalsis continues to move things along. And when it is ready to leave the small intestine, um, it actually is going to go through some other filters before it goes out. Um, but what we can see here, this is just kind of showing you step by step. You've got your carbs breaking down in your oral cavity and in your small intestine, both from enzymes within the small intestine and enzymes coming from the pancreas. Um, the proteins are digested in the stomach again, and there's enzymes from both the pancreas and the, epi um, the small intestines epithelium that help to break down the proteins. The nucleic acids do not get broken down until they get to the um, small intestine. And they can, there are enzymes from both places there that help to break those down. While fats are only going to be broken down via the enzymes that are generated from the pancreas. The jejunum and the ileum um, are also um, able to play a role with the small intestine. They absorb nutrients and they absorb water. Um, we've got a lot of nutrients. Again, we're just constantly breaking down this food. So we need to have a place for all these nutrients to go. There is a lot of surface area available through the small intestine uh, that basically is acting like a brush and it's able to help give lots of places for those nutrients to be absorbed. Um, there's definitely a lot more you would get into if you were taking a physiology class, but we're going to stop it here for this intro biology class. Um, a little bit more. Um, so the nutrients actually do not go straight out into the body. They're going to go to the liver. Um, the liver is able to make sure those nutrients go where they need to go. It's able to help. Um, it's the storage place for glucose, at least initially. Um, they can convert other organic molecules like glucose can be converted to glycogen. Um, and they also can break down like drugs and things like that or other organic molecules um, that your body wouldn't be able to get rid of otherwise. It's actually in the small intestine where the epithelial cells absorb the lipid components that have been broken apart, the fatty acids and the monoglycerides, and they reform them into triglycerides. Um, they coat those now fat units with phospholipids and cholesterols and proteins to form these chylomicrons um, that will move into lacteals. And I'll show you a picture where all this is going. And so, so the fats are kind of separate from the proteins and the carbohydrates. However, if you have a lot of fats, I do think some of those can go into your liver and that's where you get the fatty liver issues. Um, lymphatic vessels um, are able to take the chylomicron containing lymph, that's that extracellular fluid, to veins that then return the blood to the heart, um, which is where we can get fatty buildup in our cardiac muscles. Okay, so the picture on the left is showing you the villi of the small intestine. Um, and then is taking that and breaking it down a little bit further. You can see the veins traveling to the liver from the small intestine. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you've got all the individual little villi and you've got your capillaries, your epithelial cells. And so again, that's where you're going to have the source of the fatty acids um, reform into triglycerides. And then they travel through um, the lacteal, um, which is able to go straight into the lymph vessel. Once they have formed their chymo, oh, forgetting the name of it, sorry, the chylomicrons, and then they would go straight up into um, the vessels that would lead up to your heart.
Okay, so they're showing you another picture of it breaking down. The large intestine is where we're going to be absorbing a lot of the remaining water that's present. It's connected via the ileocecal valve, 1.5 meters is its approximate length. Um, the large intestine consists of the cecum, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. Um, so I talked about how it's going to take up water. It's also going to help to take up salts from any um, solid waste before you're eliminated. Um, before they're eliminated, sorry, you're not eliminated. Um, the cecum helps to get rid of, we haven't really talked about what happens with roughage, like um, lettuce, spinach, things like that. The cecum helps to ferment that plant material, um, and it's the connection point between the small and the large intestines. It contains um, a little extension called the appendix, which can have some roles with immunity. And there um, is the colon, it says houses bacteria, um, that can live on unabsorbed organic material. So that would be like this plant material um, and sometimes can produce vitamins. So there are the different components of your large intestine. Um, and there you can see the cecum where it's connecting to your small intestine and that little appendix thing coming off of it. Okay. Um, to get rid of our waste materials, that's in the form of feces, undigested material, bacteria, it becomes more solid as it moves through the colon and more water is removed. That's stored in the rectum until it's eliminated. Um, and then there are sphincters the between the rectum and the anus to help to control those bowel movements. All right, so evolutionary adaptations that have kind of come along with diet. So vertebrates tend to have a pretty basic plan, um, but there are some variations depending on what types of food sources um, they eat. That would be dental. Their variations also within their stomach and intestinal. And then we're also going to talk about some mutualistic adaptations. So dentition would be the first one. What types of teeth and the amount of teeth that we tend to see, and that will play a role based on your diet. So carnivores are going to have molars and canines and incisors. Herbivores are going to have more of the broad ridged surfaces like your molars. And then omnivores would have both. So there you can see examples. It's not that you won't have all of them, but you're going to have more of the ones that you need. And they're going to be more useful in the form that you need them. So carnivores have larger expandable stomachs. Herbivores and omnivores um, are going to have bigger alimentary canals, or sorry, longer alimentary canals, because remember, they've got the undigested stuff. They've got the the grass and the plants that have to be fermented to be broken down um, as opposed to um, carbohydrates or lipids or um, probably peptides. So remember we said how the cecum is where you're going to have your undigested plant material kind of fermented. Um, you can see in the carnivore, we don't have too much of a space for that um, because that's not our primary source of food. We can see over with more of a herbivore, you need to have a much larger cecum um, to be able to handle digesting um, all of that, or sorry, fermenting all that undigested plant material. Okay. Mutualistic adaptations. So we talked about the fermentation chambers. Um, so what's going to happen um, here with these animals called ruminants, aka calves, is that you need to have that microorganisms be involved to help to break down some of this undigested plant material. So a mutualistic relationship develops. The cow takes in grass or um, plant material and it enters into the rumen. It is partially um, broken down in the rumen and it actually comes back out um, the cow spits it, chews it back up and helps to break it down a little bit more so that then, and through the, um, so that happens in the reticulum. And then once it comes back in, um, it moves into the amasum, which helps to break it down even further. And then finally it's able to go into the abomasum and move through the rest of the digestive system. Feedback circuits. Uh, we're going to talk about some different examples of feedback circuits that influence digestion and energy storage as well as appetite. 
um, what type of food and what type of nutrients you need depend on or will vary based on what's available to you and what an animal has chosen to eat. Um, the digestive system does not work together all at once. It works as it's needed based on what's in it. Um, and so the nervous system and the endocrine system will be involved in regulating that digestion process. Um, the endocrine system does it with hormones. Okay. So if we take a look at um, this particular picture, we see that what's the stomach as it takes in food and starts to enlarge um, will promote the release of gastrin, which will help to get the gastric juices ready to go within the stomach. Um, with our second example here, we have that as chyme has entered into our small intestine, um, secretin and another enzyme CCK will um, be released. The, CC, the CCK is helping to release some of the enzymes that need to go into the small intestine to help break down the food. The secretin is producing the buffer, um, the alkaline um, solution that will help to neutralize the acidic chyme. We also see that um, CCK will play a role if you have um, a pretty, sorry, um, CCK will also help to encourage the um, release of bile to help to break down fats. If you have a lot of secretin and a lot of CCK that are released, they actually help to slow down the digestion process because you've had a pretty fatty meal. And so they make it so that it's moving a little bit slower um, to help to give it more time to digest um, the, the, the fats that were a part of that particular um, food meal. Energy storage. Um, energy molecules that are not needed initially will get stored in the liver um, through or in muscle cells through the form glycogen. And if there is energy above and beyond that, it's stored in adipose tissue. Um, we talked about with cellular respiration, how we can oxidize our glucose to give us ATP to be able to do what we need to. And there are two hormones, insulin and glucagon, which help to break down the glycogen into glucose. Um, liver is where this homeostasis process takes place. Um, when you have a hefty carbohydrate meal, your insulin levels go up and that causes glycogen to be formed from the glucose. And if your blood sugar drops, glucagon will start to break down the glycogen. And that glucagon is another enzyme, that, or another hormone, excuse me, that will break down the glycogen and cause glucose to form. So here's that feedback loop. Homeostasis is what we would, ex the levels that are considered normal for glucose in your, in your bloodstream. So we see that it goes up after you eat. The pancreas releases the insulin or secretes the insulin, um, which allows um, the glucose to be converted into glycogen. And then when your blood glucose levels drop, your pancreas, rather than secreting insulin, secretes glucagon which will help to break down the glycogen into glucose and cause your blood, um, glucose blood levels to raise. If you have taken in too much um, nourishment, you can um, become obese um, and that excess energy would be stored as fat and it causes um, or is thought to contribute to a lot of pretty serious um, medical um, situations such as diabetes, colon, breast cancer, heart attack, strokes. Um, some mechanisms researchers have been able to identify that help to um, regulate the body weight um, will um, are based in part on hormones that affect both long-term and short-term appetite. Um, and one study they've seen is with leptin that it's made by adipose tissue. And so if you lose weight, um, if you have leptin present, that helps to reduce your appetite. Um, but as you lose weight and you're not making as much leptin, that can actually cause an increase in appetite. So it um, kind of acts as a vicious cycle. Um, ghrelin um, is the um, is known the hormone that prevents. Um, sorry, does not prevent that triggers hunger feelings. 
Um, insulin, as we've talked about, is what's going to help to break down the sugar. But insulin also plays a role in suppressing your appetite. Um, PYY is secreted by the small intestine. Um, it's that happens after your meals that also helps to suppress your appetite by countering garrulence impact. And then we talked about what leptin will do. So how does obesity play a role with evolution? There's a species of birds that call petrels that become obese as chicks. Um, so they have to observe, um, consume enough protein, um, from their food to, um, take in more calories than what they're going to use up. What this idea of maintaining weight comes from is, again, survival of the fittest. Um, by having nutrients stored in your body, um, you're more likely to survive famines. And so that would have been um, kind of one of the issues with maintaining weight.